So today we talk a bit about artisans and the rise and the organization of the arts during the Low Middle Ages. Um, this is obviously a process that took place within uh, the rebirth of uh, urban centers in this new leap that the citizen life uh, experienced uh, since the 11th century and that had especially a great development of and that so uh, a great development over artisan activities. Um, let's say that roughly from 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 the year 2000 uh, conceived as a concept rather than <laughs> than a day, a specific date, there was a, a very strong transfer of those um, res mm, workers from the countryside to the cities and um, there was a multiplication in parallel with, uh, with the uh, demographical um, growth of the cities, uh, the, uh, the widening of the, and, and the, 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 uh, the growth of the productive specialization, and obviously also very important uh, progress in the, the same uh, te techniques. Um, uh, in 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 that point, and um, the and therefore within this frame of this economical, and social, and political frame, the the incidence of the artisans um, rose, uh, you know, considerably within the the uh, urban communities, and obviously the um, the physical pra um, place par excellence of the artisan work was the shop. Um, uh, inside of which um, the um, there were several people working, uh, the masters, uh, usually one or or more uh, apprentices and other works and sp uh, other workers and especially um, in 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 the later part of um, the low middle ages of salaried um, uh, workers who uh, worked uh, sort of freelance because they had very short-term contracts to make their work cheaper and, and the costs in production lower, a bit like today, <laughs> telling the truth. This brought also to very serious uprisings, especially during the 14th century, many cities all over, all over Europe that were, however, put down especially because these salaried workers uh, didn't make very considerable uh, part of uh, the uh, the city's demographics, or at least they didn't have the the actual political strength to 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 take over the uh, the urban uh, policy, and um, and obviously the masters had um, autonomy and um, um, uh, obviously a preeminent uh, place in in this. In, in this w uh, artisan world, um, they were the bosses essentially, and um, and not just f for the fact that they they had obviously certain competence competences that uh, were vital for the artisan work, but I'd say more for the fact of being the the shop's um, owner. And therefore, w w ha having the um, uh, the money to make the business uh, being um, financed, and um, the the apprentice was the only uh, person um, uh, to whom um, the 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 actual knowledge of the of the artisan techniques were 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 handed down to and. Uh, and this obviously uh, happened through a path that so uh, the apprentice rising in the hierarchy of the craft until the the attainment um, after many years of work in the shop and the um, and overcoming certain you know proofs and exams um, of the title of um, of master uh, himself. Um, you have to think that uh, you know the, the knowledge of um, uh, of the artisan um, um, uh, of the artisan work was very often kept um, secret in many ways because it was something so precious that allowed these um, the, the 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 work to be done essentially that 
um, very often it remained within this circle of very few people that usually uh, were part of the same family or at least intermarried quite often. Um, there was definitely a lot of competition, but let's say that the craftsmen of a certain um, of a certain art would mm, of a certain job would try to you know to intermarry with the, the among their families to keep you know not just uh, the the knowledge but also the money altogether, um, which is something that doesn't help us very much from a certain point of view, historically speaking, because and uh, relatively especially to the knowledge that we can have about those uh, technologies um, not just during the Middle Ages but uh, even up to the, the Industrial Age um, telling the truth because um, <coughs> these uh, knowledge w w w w which were quite often very empirical consider that they, they didn't know physics as such so and were even very uh, and and we're talking also very ab about very complex uh, complex technologies so something that uh, required a lot of you know a lot of passages a lot of of skill and in practice was something that um was kept secret wasn't written down and also for um competitive reasons um, and it's very fascinating because today, with modern uh, technologies, um, in turn, we can analyze these artifacts and, and, and discovering uh, physically or chemically very in interesting things about how those people worked them. But one of the most beautiful things that, I, that I, I, I often recall when we talk about the Middle Ages is that um, in this... Um, in these techniques, uh, you know, you see that, yeah, the people didn't know much about physics, and uh, there were a lot of imperfections from from a strictly uh, um, engineering point of view. You know, the the idea that I don't know, um, well, they didn't have our perfection of measurement, essentially, our mathematical knowledge, but at least up to a certain point. But y and yet, what they did in those times if it was done well, it's something that today, with wa our own technologies in the 21st century, we can we're not able to replicate. Take a sword, a sword, you know, uh, you know, in order to make a good sword, maybe, you know, uh, you, you, you made other quite crappy swords <laughs> uh, in, in large numbers, but that very good one is o was often a masterpiece, in fact, for and was recognized as, as such. And even though today we have better steel, we have better you know, industrial processes that can make excellent materials and stuff, the characteristics that that sword had uh, for, for fighting, for, for actual use, is something that today we cannot replicate. So uh, we have to see these medieval craftsmen as the depositories, as of a very sophisticated knowledge that was based on, in fact, in generation after generation of uh, uh, observing, of practice, of failure as well, uh, because competition was something very serious at that point as well, and money were needed um, that time, like uh, it's needed t to today. But um, and 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 this explains obviously how you know jealous these artisans were about their own work and um, and obviously we have to think that together with these um, development of, uh, of the development of artisan um, activity there was a whole civilization taking you know um, developing in parallel because the uh, the craftsmen obviously had to trade, had to sell, uh, had to make contracts, had to make investments. So there was a whole world of other workers um, depending on this, uh, jurists formulating a law, uh, new laws, new norms to make economy more fluid. Um, uh, there was a lot of also of um, progressive. Um, you know, interaction between different crafts because obviously certain um, certain enterprises, certain achievements couldn't be accomplished 
but with the cooperation of several specialists thinking I don't know about building uh, a cathedral how many specialized work um, you needed and how uh, how much that costed um, so uh, and, and we're talking about a bit the, the the communal civilization as such it's not surprised that it's from uh, from shops like the one of, pa of great painters, painters and, and sculptures that, that maybe weren't specialized as such originally. The, um, the, the Renaissance actually took place. So, obviously a very different world from ours, but that um, was similar to ours in, in the way, um, you know, things were uh, all activities were intertwined in a certain sense and they reflected at the same time the mindset and the ideas and the knowledge of uh, of a world civilization and of a different era. Um, so uh, the, the world organization would grow increasingly more complex. And the interesting thing about um, the, the arts um, was indeed that um, the um, they they had also political role and we have to wait uh, until the 12th century but probably something happened also before it's just that we don't know that historically because it's not documented um, to see um, uh, the rise of the first artisan corporations hmm? and these were organisms um, in which came to you know to 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 unite all those who practiced a certain uh, craft and the corporations that um, first of all they had many names all over Europe this is something that um, that happened transversely in, in Western Europe um, more or less at the same time and uh, and obviously the corporations were known in different names according to the various regions of Europe um, in the documents of the time we read, um, for instance, the names like uh, arts, companies, mm, practices, um, these were names especially that you find um, with the um, almost identical transliteration in, uh, in northern Italy. Um, in Germany the corporations were called Zunfte and Gilden in uh, in the Flanders um, so you have all these various names um, and, um, and and what was their what, what was their deal I mean um, they um, initially um, had essentially the, the, the aim to promote um, to, to promote the um, um, a, a common you know ensurement uh, of uh, a common protection of all these working activities so we're talking especially about economical uh, assistance of the various members of these corporations and at the same time to achieve um, and this is a bit less <laughs> a bit less nice the um, um, the monopoly hmm, uh, of the um, uh, of their working force essentially um, they basically forbade the exercise of the craft to all those who were not affiliated and they um, they pr precluded at least tendentially the um, uh, the uh, insertion of, um, of of foreign artisans that wanted to to come in the city we have seen how you know the phenomenon was actually born um uh, also thanks to immigration into the cities at a certain point you know the the, the more uh, you know the most powerful masters reunited and corporations said okay now we we are you know these groups of of um, uh, of artisans we say that our corporation in our city is full, <laughs> let's say, and nobody else can come from the outside. And this would obviously cause a lot of attrition between groups, between social groups. This 
uh, was obviously pretty much played on by um, by politics and by all the other social classes like the knights and the, the peasants who were involved into in, in the whole uh, economical sphere o of the cities and obviously the aim of these confederations was to to safeguard um, um, the um, even the um, balance between the demand and the offer of the products, uh, obviously uh, in, in favor of the of their own uh, of their own category, of meaning that uh, they they could regulate uh, prices of of the um, of the products, but as well the the ones of the of the of the first um, uh, of the first materia prima, essentially of the raw material, um, <laughs> and um, and and they also guarded, obviously, over the uh, requisites, um, you know, the standards of production, uh, because that was a good way to stem the competition of other masters that could maybe make. Cheaper products that, however, sold more uh, in certain spe within especially served the poorer classes, and uh, we all know these things by living in our days. And uh, um, and it's funny that um, it, it's the same mechanisms of that time, but that especially um, they were being born at that time, or at least this was a time in European history in which that was being rehappening again from from antiquity and and especially it was developing also in a very different way from antiquity itself with a much more uh, pre-capitalistic um, you know um, even mindset and organization compared to, to to the ancient world also because we're talking about a much more dynamic um, um, Europe than the one it was at the time of the Romans from from a um, entrepreneurial point of view and also for resources and and, and people involved into these um, especially from from the base rather than the top in, into these activities um, and therefore they would look at the quality of the manifacts of the rights of acquisitions and they would disciplinate uh, and regulate the access to the raw materials by for mm, forbidding every form of um, of uh, you know monopoly outside <laughs> to their own for uh, speculative aims, obviously. Um, so as I was saying, this also produced much uh, thinking in um, uh, in low matters. You know, um, the comparison with, with with the Roman world is interesting because this was a time um, in Europe in which l uh, Roman law was being revived throughout um, the Western the Western world, uh, essentially because society uh, had grown mm, to a level of, of complexity that was comparable to the one of of the ancient uh, of ancient Rome, or at least when um uh, ob obviously of the Roman Empire in the time in which that law was, uh, had been developed in turn and um and yet at the same time um exactly because there was this difference between the the level of uh, economical uh, dynamism and entrepreneuriality of between the, the Roman world and and the, the medieval world you notice that um the medievals uh, w weren't satisfied even with the Roman law, and they would start creating other um, laws in, in for for trade and other economical fields that would reflect um, that would answer to to the, to the problems to to the question raised by these uh, different organizations that you you don't find so developed uh, in the ancient in the ancient law. Um, so there is also a lot of experimentalism. Uh, much would mm, obviously be born, you know, quite spontaneously by uh, by practice, by use, by tradition. But uh, other things at a certain point had to be set uh, legally speaking, because otherwise, you know, you, uh, that would have even even harmed the s the same 
mm, security of the of the trade uh, and the of the economical production itself and um and and it's very interesting uh coming back on the political point how these um of these um of these arts were uh, essentially um a closing every um uh, every opportunity to to those who wor weren't part of it by saying that all the people who worked within the arts so from the masters to the apprentices to the other workers even the um you know the the, the salaried one um um had to operate within the the art within the 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 corporation so they were immediately under its uh, rules and uh, regulations, um, and, um, uh, and 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 you can note the stratification of this um, organization as a as a very political one because only the masters uh, had full rights to decide, you know, um, what these uh, regulations were. For instance, the masters could vote within uh, the uh, the art assemblies, um, and um, and they could obtain also uh, certain offices within the same art, um, and within the same art, in this sense, there would be also a lot of uh, rivalries and competitions because, um, especially those um, periodic. Um, offices that so you know different people changing the same place after a certain time were created for uh, in this cyclical uh, order uh, and function exactly to you know prevent you know s maybe a master with his own shop prevailing on others and trying to keep a sort of um, of of body of this um, united. In fact, corporation uh, derives from the Latin word corpus, which means body. So they, the corporation ha was uh, ideally speaking meant to be uh, working as uh, one person, mm -hmm. and corporativism in this sense was um, quite important even during the same modern age to define I in the political thinking because. Um, even not just arts were seen as a body, but even the empire and the kingdoms or uh, the family, uh, etc. Think about Baudin, who wrote in the seven uh, in the 16th century, who was exactly you know um, using this um, corporal metaphor for um, for um, uh, explaining the uh, the social the, the the French society of the time with with a unique body whose uh, head was the, the the king and then all the other smaller parts you know um, made in the, the rest of, uh, of the uh, body parts so um, uh, it was really felt very deeply into uh, medieval society this idea of belonging to that house to that art to that quarter to that city you know was a lot of corporatism more than you know than just in in um, in the same co th than the same corporations but as a, as a view in, in on how to say on um, to which um, conceiving the world political organization of society from top to base and um, and the organization of these arts um, new um, its um, earliest uh, experiences um, in certain areas of Europe first, obviously the ones that were that had seen, um, you know, uh, uh, that were uh, the leaders in um, in development of urban centers and trade and uh, and in fact of uh, artisan working. And we're talking especially about the 12th century uh, communal Italy. Um, but there are also other places um, like, for instance, the Artois, the uh, Brabant and the Flanders that were quite developed areas as well in the north of, uh, of France and uh, the, 
uh, in today's Belgium, um, and, um, and 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 there were although certain differences because in in communal Italy um, the uh, cities were uh, a bit um, the leading political entity within the um, you know the, the you know the Italian landscape in the Artois, Brabant and Flanders things were a bit different because the feudal organization formally prevailed in spite of the great development of the urban centers and in 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 this uh, in this part of northern Europe what you see is that the w there was especially a great power of the merchants rather than the artisans themselves um and in fact um they um the, they they kind of even were in contrast in some measure uh, with the the artisans um and they they had different interests and even though th they operated essentially on the same uh, economical activities they uh, they weren't really uh, they didn't really act as one um and uh, we can't say that um um the um the greatest importance of these um uh, of these merchants in this area of Europe can be related to especially the fact that uh, thinking about the fairs of Champagne um you could see that there were really a l lots of agricultural uh, resources put in motion um there were a lot lots of merchants in the sh in the fairs of Champagne um that came also from Italy from from other areas where there was obviously a, a quite developed artisan um mm, uh, organization but in a certain sense merchants in that part of northern france and belgium were more dealing with the, the goods that came directly from the agricultural world so from areas that were mostly held by the nobles so here it, it's explained why you know uh, they were operating at a different level than um, compared to artisan city artisans mm -hmm. and and in spite of this uh, in differences between um you know the various European regions that I find always very I interesting in comparative perspective. Um, there is to say that, uh, in in general terms, th the importance of these uh, artisan activities w were huge, um, considering even even the material culture of that time, um, because these cities produced wealth, means. Um, they had a huge power, uh, a huge control of, of um, over production and a, a, a very vast number of goods. And therefore, when you think about, um, you know, uh, f for instance, something that requires really a lot of resources like war, think about the logistical problems of of the feudal armies with these huge number of, of horses, of you know, and and uh, you know, of an armor needed and bows and you know, a lot of material that was practice built uh, by the artisans. B and 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 very often, um, the armies would be fed by artisan, by si by by um, city communities um, who maybe wanted to play uh, that card in order to receive you know certain benefits from the king maybe and therefore they helped him in in that particular campaign by you know um emptying the 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 cooperative warehouses that were full of goods to to feed their armies and to fight etc so it was a very syner sy sy synergic world and a world that was um very slowly passing from a largely agrarian society to uh yeah always uh, an agrarian society but what with a much greater emphasis on um on other types of goods think even about firearms you know firearms were developed originally with <laughs> and this is quite interesting uh from uh, certain artisans that obviously had nothing to do with firearms because they didn't exist before um and you know which kind of artisans were they um uh potters because potters were the only ones who had at that time with the 
um, the, 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 the lathes, um, the uh, technological um, ability of creating something, um, uh, these tubes essentially with uh, that make up the cannons, and in fact, if you see the very first um, firearms um, uh, witness in uh, you know in, uh, in Western Europe, they were essentially made up like pots because they were built in the same way, at least uh, from a geometrical you know material you know point need of construction. So. Um, think at how, you know, even at that point when firearms be start becoming a must for every updated prince who wanted to conquer someone else's <laughs> land, uh, how important cities were I in the production of weapons. Um, and this was of extreme importance, and, and the whole society at that time would therefore rely on these uh, economical, you know, aspects of, of society. Um, you can have, you know, for instance, iron. You can have all the iron you want, but if you don't have the manpower to to work it, to extract it, to uh, to treat it, and to make uh, uh, to make swords and cannons, what 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 do you have it for? Uh, and this is why economical history is so fascinating because it it it's not so immediate. It's not so obvious to understand it. And and it and, and it um, it proves how you know intelligence in in arts uh, and crafts was to you know to to uh, there was to in order to need um, and to uh, to 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 play in the world in the surrounding world in the society in which they they existed. Um, and um, w we will be seeing that another time. Um, how you know the corporations would acquire uh, a much higher political power uh, within the medieval society, and especially in Italy, uh, you find that um, that is obviously always at the lead in, in economical and, uh, and technological terms. Uh, in the low middle ages, how in Italy uh, the corporations um, even managed to enter within the same institutions. I mean, there were certain uh, city offices and uh, then and city councils, and at a certain time uh, it starts emerging the Council of the Arts, that basically decides what uh, you know how did the city have to be ruled. In Florence, this is most famous. In the 14th century Florence, you have you know the city that is ruled by the arts. In fact, institutionally, mm, not just you know de facto, but also informally recognized. Um, and um, but we will be seeing that in another time. For now, I hope it was interesting enough <laughs> to hear about it. It was a bit of a generic video, but uh, maybe these kind of introductions are always interesting. So, um, I hope you enjoyed this video, uh, therefore, and I, um, if you did, please share it or leave a like or subscribe to my channel to receive further contents. Um, I, I thank you very much for, uh, for listening and um, I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye!